This is Tony Mark. And this is Russell Grether of the Mark and Grether Group, and welcome to the Malibu Podcast. Malibu, Malibu, Malibu. thought it'd be fun to interview you both because you have great stories and because you are one of the senior statesmen now of Malibu real estate and the history of Malibu real estate since Michael Novotny retired and Kim uh, Colin retired. I don't know of anyone that's been around that's still as active as you are um, in the real estate community. So thanks for talking to us. And we just wanted to um, you know, kind of go through the history of Malibu real estate with you in 30 minutes or less. So, um, a, from reading your your little bio on Compass, it sounds like you first came out to Malibu to go to Pepperdine. Is that correct? That is correct. Where were you from originally? The Valley. The Valley. The dreaded Valley. I used to come out here to boogie board. So, uh, Pepperdine was my third college, and uh, I did graduate from there in 1977. Amazing. Were you a surfer from the dreaded valley that came here to surf, or was it to really go to business school? I was one of those that drove out early in the morning, but uh, ended up usually at uh, Zuma Beach. And uh, yeah, actually, uh, I think my mom used to drive me. Actually, I used to hitchhike way back in the day, and my mom would drive me, and then when I could drive myself. And uh, Malibu is just, as you guys know, is just there's no other place like it in the world. So. Uh, once I graduated Pepperdine, it was like, what can I do to stay in Malibu? And uh, there weren't that many jobs, really, that you could actually make a living here. You know, there's a lot of restaurants to work at and, and um, odds and ends. I, I worked at Market Basket for a while down there. And um, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, actually suggested I get a real estate license. So that's kind of how that started. That's fantastic. What was it like, you know, when you go to places like Point Doom or Malibu Park that are largely developed? What was it like back then? Tony tells me stories of when he started in real estate that there was a book that you would have and oh, yeah. marketing was easy and Well, it was a one page contract. There were no there were no cell phones. There was only landlines. There were no fax machines. You either had to snail mail a document or drive. And I remember driving to Newport Beach, drove to San Diego once to get a document signed. I mean, it was, that's how we used to do it. We even and, did that when I started, you know, I'd have to drive into Beverly Hills in the middle of the night to get something signed or the fax machine would jam and have to drive in in the middle of the night. But yeah, that was a whole different, <coughs> there, whole different There world. was a book. There was a book that was delivered once a week. And that's how you knew what properties were listed. And we would like wait for that book to be delivered. And then you'd immediately turn to Malibu and start looking and then, uh, you know, getting on the phone, making calls. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty incredible to think about that for so computers. So you've seen some properties probably trade four or five times over in your time out here, huh? Oh yeah, cool. and you think about the woulda, coulda, shouldas too, right? The, the, the beach homes that, you know, I mean, I was living in a beach home when I was going to Pepperdine. It was on the market for $96,000. And uh, my roommate and I had to keep it clean every day because somebody was coming in almost every day. We were only paying $300 a month, 150 each, to be right on the beach at County Line, Livingston. Wow. And we had the speakers turned out. We literally could surf right in front of the house. And I remember calling my dad and going, Dad, I go, I think you should come check out this house. It's, it's $96,000. And it must be a great deal because people are looking all the time. He goes, ah, oh, it's too far out. I don't want to be out there. And they ended up buying something on Malibu Road, but um, ninety-six thousand dollars for a beach house, and that thing just recently sold for like three million. But you know, in perspective, the uh, what were the broad beach homes back then were probably what 
under two hundred. Yeah, my parents bought their first house for one hundred fifty thousand. One hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, nineteen. Carbon Beach. You could have had your pick, but that was a lot of money then, right? I mean, ninety six thousand dollars to me as a student at Pepperdine. I was like, no way, I could afford that. My dad was a doctor, still working. So, um, but yeah, the 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 prices back then, Point Doom. I mean, you think about the. $10 million bluff lots now, what those were going for back then? Oh, my gosh. And you uh, see those pictures. It looks like Mexico, you know, and that was like 1940 or 1950. Oh, uh, with the oil wells even? On I don't the, remember the oil wells. I just remember you look at those pictures, like those aerials of Point Doom, and it's just oh. this big open expanse. It looks, like, uh, it looks like Hollister Ranch or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's like the big open grassy fields. It just looks beautiful. I mean, it still is, right? I mean, right. it's not overly... Mansionized because the lots are all pretty good size. There's only a few spots where they cut them up, you know, three, four to an acre. But for the most part, you know, it's still an acre plus, which is good. So back to your real estate history, then you started as an agent then? It yeah, I started an agent. I, I remember to this day, we were sitting at McDonald's down there. It's probably the only time I've been to that McDonald's. And we were sitting there, my wife and I, and... Um, there was an office right next to it. It's Sober Living House now, right? And it was International Real Estate Network, home of the Looky Loos. And we were sitting there, and uh, my wife just said, well, why, don't you go, why don't you go over there and talk to them, right? So I walked over, and uh, I'll never forget it. Chris Frost was sitting there, and, um, and he has a little Cadillac out in front, and Frank Roop, Carl Deneen, those were the brokers. And I mean, with, within like minutes, it seemed like I was in his car and we were racing off to Montanito to go look at some land and we just hit it off immediately. And I go, wow, this is the place. So I never really talked to or interviewed anyone else, just hit it off with Chris immediately. And, and uh, so I started there and uh, made a sale my first 30 days, maybe. I got uh, somebody, I don't remember if they called in or walked in, uh, bought some lots up on uh, up Latigo. Uh, Twenty-seven five. Please, sir. <laughs> Turn your phone. Is that my phone? It's your phone. Oh, great. <laughs> All right. Off. Off. And then, like the, the week after it closed, he referred me his best friend, and he bought the lots next door for twenty-two five, and you know, ten percent commission. And I had money in my pocket in the first month or so. It was great, and off I went. So, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's very professional. <clears throat> hey, it's a working office here, you know? <laughs> We're getting there. So, yeah, I, I hung out with uh, Frank and Chris and uh, Carl Deneen. Ask Carl Deneen and Associates for about two years. And then this guy named Michael Stearns uh, came and approached me. And he had this wild idea. Uh, he was friends with the guy that owned the Malibu Pier, William Huber. And uh, William Huber, apparently the state wanted to buy the pier. So I think it was like $3 million. And so he, Michael, somehow talked him into listing it for the auction. He had this wild idea that we were going to auction off uh, as many properties as we could. So I actually got the, the brochure here because I, I saved this. It's such a collector's item. So a guy named Earl Dugan, who is a big real estate uh, advertising guy. Maybe you know him? Uh, I know that wow. name. He used to live at, uh, on Broad Beach yeah, Road, 31376 Broad Beach. Um, 31376. And uh, Little Broad Beach Road. Oh, that was a few doors. Seven, two or seven, six, one of those. He yeah. was a great guy. So the three of us got these 50 or so properties listed, and we were going to have this auction in February 10th, 1980. Which was kind of crazy. February, it's like if it's going to rain in Malibu, that's that's when it rains. But it was the most glorious, beautiful, sunny day. We had some of we had the property where Nobu is. We had the 16-acre knoll up there. That's the the that lawsuit right now. Um, uh, we had some of the most prime properties, and then we had some not so prime properties. We had a few condos, some lots. Um, and there we were trying to auction off these properties, and every one of these sellers had put unrealistic prices on there. But we were hoping we would just get the excitement of being out there, having buyers there. And we had the pier was full, and there were helicopters of overhead. They were filming this for the news. And uh, that's a great idea. It was incredible. And we sold one house that day for 171000 on Corral Canyon. I think the guys, the brothers that own it, still own it. 
Um, but Michael was like so positive and he's like, don't worry, don't worry. He goes, we got all these names and numbers. We'll negotiate. The, we're, we're, this is, you know, we're going to make these deals. And then that was on Sunday, Wednesday of that week. Um, it started raining and it didn't stop. And that was the, like one of the floods of all floods in Malibu. It, it, it rained for like 10 days straight. All the roads were closed. Rocks were coming down. Roads were closed. Cosentino nursery was wiped out down there. And the interest rates started going up like a percent a day. And like in two weeks from then, when finally the rain stopped, the rates were up to like 18%. And we're sitting in his office trying to make deals. And <laughs> next thing I know, maybe it was a few weeks after that, somebody comes in and starts taking out the furniture, the phones, and Michael's in the back smoking grass. <laughs> uh, and I'm sitting there going, it looks like I need another job. So... That was the end of that. Oh. <laughs> wow. So they literally just walled it up? We would it? once say, I might have, it, it might have been a month later, but it wasn't long after that. He put all his marbles into this auction, and uh, it didn't work out. And the state ended up buying the pier, and none of these people that put these unrealistic numbers on them, and I have the numbers in here too, what the bids were and what they wanted, but uh, it, was, it was something I'll never forget. And it was like almost 40, it's over like 40 years ago. And the actual pier itself was for sale that day? The too? pier was for sale. That was the big draw, wow. the pier. And nobody yeah. obviously bought the pier. Uh, a guy named Mansoor Yaman, I still remember his name. He actually made a bid on it, and he tried buying it, but he wasn't going to pay what the state was going to pay. You know, he wanted to, to pay less. But uh, that was quite an experience. Yeah, that would have been a good deal back then. <laughs> going through that whole thing. The Rether Pier. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> and it included the parking lot across the street. Wow. It was not just the pier. It was the parking lot next to Casa, oh, next Escobar, to Casa Escobar, that, that vacant lot. So yeah, you guys look through that later. There's some cool properties in there that you'll you'll definitely recognize. Um, but anyway, that was one of my uh, uh, crazy uh, ventures. That's pretty good. Huh? And then what was Malibu Realty the next? Yeah, I went to Malibu Realty for uh, about nine years, and then that's when Charles um, Wilson asked me to uh, if I'd manage. And that was right away you started managing. Or you uh, were no, I think maybe a couple years. Um, he liked to go to Hawaii. Um, he, he liked to fish, so uh, he, he wanted somebody there. And I think he, I think he, Jim Rapp was after me all the time, so he he knew it. So I think he wanted to kind of ground me there. So he offered me the manager position, which was which was cool. It was kind of like babysitting kids that were already asleep because he was there all the time. So <laughs> it it was it was nice. I, I really Charles was like the most honest guy in the world, and uh, he was he was really nice to work for, but. Uh, couldn't couldn't really get a smile out of him much. He just was. Uh, you know him? Uh, I met him. My dad took me into the office a few times when I was a kid. I just remember everything smelled like kind of deteriorating leather and polyester and cigarettes. Cigarettes, and, yeah. yeah. But just, you know, he and Louis Bush, th those guys are two of the icons that go back that just have these these, these really great reputations. You know? Yeah. They just they wouldn't take a you know. They were just the most honest guys. My dad liked most of that generation of, you know, the old lions of yeah. real estate. He liked those guys. My dad doesn't like everybody. You know, he's a pretty opinionated guy, but he thought they were all pretty good guys. They were. He worked there for a little while. I think he was at Malibu Realty for a short period. Alan? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, for a little little while. I don't think he would give my dad the deal he wanted. And he went, to, I think, Fred Sands after that or something. But... um Anyway, yeah, but he liked him. You know, it's funny, uh, just thinking this, Jeff Certo, I hired, he was working at Joffrey's at night, and I, I hired him as an agent, and he kept asking for more and more floor time, and I don't know why I didn't give it to him, and he got, he got mad, and he left, <laughs> and he was like, I, mean, I think to this day, he says, yeah, you motivated me, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So when you made the transition to manager, did that just seem like a better fit, or was it nice to see a guaranteed paycheck, or was it even a guaranteed paycheck no, back then? No, no, it was just an override, and it was nice. It supplemented and and kind of got me involved with other with with you know with with helping people, which I really enjoy. Um, I was doing I was selling a lot of mobile homes back then. I was kind of Dave Carter before Dave Carter. So, I mean, I sold, gosh, I don't remember how many mobile homes I was because I was living in Paradise Cove. For a few years, so I was selling those places for fifty-eight, five, seventy-nine thousand, hundred and ten thousand, and now they're selling for 
800,000, million, <laughs> two million. Ted just yeah, sold his for two and a half million yeah. Yeah. without a view, right? And and they've sold as high as four and five million. So I mean, yeah, who would have thought that? I mean, what's we, the record? Five five point two. I think uh, the, the I think the uh, uh, Stevie Nicks. I think the one she sold was right. probably around four four five four and a half or five million. Uh, that was a great place to live. Um, we ended up getting kicked out of there because because we had a child, which back then was questionable whether it was legal or not. But um, I wanted to fight it. My wife didn't, so you guys know who won that that argument. And uh, so that's that was kind of sad because we moved out of Malibu, uh, 1985 or something like that. So I actually have not lived in Malibu, Is that even though to Santa Rosa. No, we moved to uh, Liberty Canyon. Oh. It's a brand new house. Uh, Malibu Builder built this little cluster of homes in Liberty Canyon, and uh, so that's where we started raising our kids over there. But um, I felt like you know all my most of my waking hours were in Malibu, so I always felt like a Malibu person. You know, I kind of just like was there at night and on the weekends. Of course, I used to work, so I come out on the weekends. As you guys know, it's hard to take time off in this business. Um, that was another nice thing about managing is. I mean, I'm, I'm working on the weekend, but not physically out here. So you do get a little more free time that way. It's a little easier to plan vacations and uh, stuff like that. It's really helpful to have someone else to lean on, too, as well, you guys you know, really, being partners. You really have that vacation thing down now. Hmm? <laughs> well, you know, I get three weeks a year, so <laughs> use it or lose well, it, right? Yeah, got to do it. Use it or lose Take it. it. <clears throat> And then you went from what Malibu Realty to CB? Is that your next? Uh, no, one? Uh, Jim Rapp uh, got me in uh, oh, Jim, 1989. Um, we were sitting down at the deli down there having lunch, and guess who comes and sits down right in front of us is Charles Wilson and Kathy Brown, <laughs> and we were we were plotting me moving over, and there it was, just like busted, right? So you moved. So. Uh, yeah, I, I made the move. I was actually very tearful uh, leaving Charles because he was such a neat guy. I, I did enjoy him, but but uh, Jim and I just connected on so many levels. Just, you know, golf, tennis. I mean, he took me to Cabo fishing, and uh, I just really, I, I just really liked him. And so I, I went to work there for about five years, and then '94 hit, and uh, that was, you know, like I mentioned, that in the early '80s there was a really bad recession. We interest rates got as high as 18, 20 percent. So, '94 uh, came, and unbeknownst to me, his company, Jim Rapp and Associates, wasn't doing that great. And Pritchett, uh, well, Jack Pritchett. So the two of them were friends. So they kind of merged together, and I was the odd man out. They didn't need a manager. Hmm. So that was hard, but um, thankfully I got recruited uh, to manage a John Douglas office. Up oh, on point right. Two. Yeah, I forgot John Douglas. It was John Douglas was in it, 1994. Was that the same office that CB is in now? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. They then bought John Douglas. Tony and Dottie were managing, and they were getting ready to retire. So they brought me in as their assistant manager for about six months, and then they just wanted to call me in and said, you're ready. So I said, wow. So one of my first hires was Chris like December that year. I think I started in July. I think I hired him in December. Uh, Ellen, Susan were already there, and um, Dale still there. Um, I don't remember who else was still there, but yeah, that was 94, and then 95, Prudential bought John Douglas, so it was Prudential John Douglas Company. And then 97, maybe, Fred Sands came into play. Sounds about right. Right there. So then it was yeah, John Douglas, Prudential, yeah. Fred Sands. Then we had three offices in Malibu, Michael, Kim, and I. And um, and then Cole Banker came in and just bought the whole lot. So we went through hmm. so many name changes in such a short time. And each time it was kind of scary. But each time it seemed like it got better each time. And, um, yeah, I was there for 20, 24 and a half years till. So I met Robert. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was one of our questions. So what was as much as you can feel comfortable telling us about your, your transition to Compass? What, um, what attracted you to this company and made you want to move over? Well, I guess it was a combination of things. Um, uh, I was getting a little burnt out. Um, and my wife said I was definitely burnt out. But, um, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. It's like now it's like almost 41, 42 years, but so 37 years around then. And um, I just didn't have kind of that passion. And there was a lot of stuff that they were wanting me to do I didn't want to do. Uh, and then all of a sudden, my buddy Stan, 
uh, Richmond, who was managing the number one office in the country in Beverly Hills, uh, he made the jump. And he just said, Jay, he goes, they want to be in Malibu next. So he said, expect a call next year. This was like November of 2015. So two weeks later, he calls. He says, are you ready? I go, what do you mean, ready for what? He said, to meet with Robert. I go, you said next year. He goes, no, they want to do it now. I go, yeah, I'll meet with the guy. So I met with him up at the restaurant up there at Trancus. It's closed now. And just Stan and Robert and I, and, and uh, he, I just was blown away from the get-go. Just everything he said was like the opposite of what I'd been hearing for the last 20-plus years. Uh, he just had this uh, um, enthusiasm, this uh, passion, this inspiration, and uh, I just, I, it was like I hadn't really been inspired by anybody in this business since, since John Douglas, you know, t some 25 years earlier. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do, right? So um, uh, they made me an offer, and I just, leap of faith, just my wife was encouraging and um, it was scary, you know. I, I didn't have an office, didn't have any agents, <laughs> working out of my car for three weeks. But I just, I just kept focused that you're doing the right thing, you're doing the right thing, and it's going to work out. It's going to work out, and uh, you know, praise God, it did. I mean, surrounded now by great guys like you and, and gals, and and uh, I mean, it's amazing to think what we've built here in three and a half years, what this company's done. I mean, it's. Pretty cool to think that we were like on second office in Southern California, the and now office. there's top. Now there's I don't know. There's hundreds of offices in, in this in this company, and yeah, they were back in New York, and I don't remember if they were in D.C. or Boston. No, they weren't in Boston yet. For sure, New York. They were established, but the company's only six years old. Wasn't it like and just uh, New York and San Francisco, maybe? No, San, San Francisco, Francisco was later. after. San Francisco was after us. Huh. San Francisco was after. No, and you know, the humble beginnings, we were in that little sweat box up there, like 800 square foot sweat box for a year and a half. And then, you know, I found this place and had no idea it was going to be such a challenge to get a, uh, an office building in Malibu. No idea. You know, we wanted, we thought about the old post office building down there and we looked at so many places, but um, this was a open canvas and, you know, the, the, I think they did a really great job doing this. I'm so grateful we got the whole top floor. I'll never forget Robert going when we pulled up. He goes, let's get it. I go, well, what do you mean, let's get it? He goes, let's get the whole building. I go, Robert, it's 10,000 square feet. We'd have to have every agent in Malibu to do that. He goes, let's get it. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> and now I wish we had. <laughs> it seemed impossible to me that this place was ever going to fill up. And it, yeah, they've done an amazing job. I mean, they, they did a few things I think are just brilliant, you know, that... Um, like just having recruiters that go out there and just really meet with the agent. I mean, Robert recruited, I guess, both of us himself. And I was like you, I was so impressed with him. I just kind of wanted to see what was going to happen. You know, when I came over, I just, I couldn't believe you would have left such a established, profitable office, you know, just figured you'd be mailing it in for the next, you know, 10, 20 years and take your surf trips and you had it made. I was so blown away when I heard you left to go with this unknown company. So, you know, my first meetings were really just to find out what you saw. I just could, And then when I started seeing what you saw, it really started making sense. I didn't actually go with any intention of ever leaving. Uh, I was at Sotheby's. I never had any intention. I was happy there. But I started taking these meetings and just saw all the things Compass was doing and the way they approached you know, just people, culture, you know, mm -hmm. that they really wanted to get behind the agents and really support them. And I think, I think the other real estate companies are just very far behind in that mentality, you know, in terms of like how to empower agents and what agents really need and want. And I think that's why Compass has done so well. You know, they, they really do understand kind of what, what helps us do better for our own business that then benefits them as a parent company. And I think a lot of the other companies are making cuts and, you know, the cuts in staff, cuts in support, and I think that's, you know, it's showing, I mean, in, in how I think well it ultimately, like, it hurts the homeowners more than anything, I think, because then the agents yeah. don't have the tools to... No, that's part of my move. I, just, I got tired of apologizing for things, you know, I'm sorry this didn't get done, I'm sorry this ad didn't get placed, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and then, you know, when I was looking at Compass, it was like 17 agents, I think, at the time, and they had you know, five full-time staff, and it was just it was crazy. So, 
Yeah, we're still far from perfect, but we are. No doubt. No we doubt. are doing, I mean, we're doing so many things the right way. The others are playing catch up, I think. I mean, I'm grateful, you know, Russell, you took the leap of faith early, you and a handful of others. And then, I, I, you know, I remember when you reached out to me and you were like blowing away and I was so jazzed that you were willing to even meet and, and look at it so seriously. And then, you know, when I found out you came over, I mean, I was just like, I don't do cartwheels, but I was doing cartwheels. <laughs> I remember I was on my honeymoon and you called me or you wrote an email and you were like, hey, you know, I'm sorry I have to leave or I'm no longer at CB, but I hope to see you guys in the future. And it was a very cryptic email. Yeah. And then I found out that Kathy Maringer, who is now the broker of record at Compass, left too. And when I found out both of you left, I was blown away. And was, I remember thinking, I have to figure out what they, what they have seen in this company. Yeah, and I do want to give a shout out to Kathy too, because she was the other part of that. It was first Stan and then Kathy. And, and um, that was like, wow, double wow. Uh, Stan actually flew back to New York and uh, I think checked it out from all angles and uh, he just said, yeah, I'm doing it. And, um, and that had a lot to do with, with making the move. Um, and then just kind of the, uh, the unknown. It was just, I don't know, it just seemed crazy, but it was good. Still is. When uh, I went to Nashville to the last Compass retreat, um, Robert... I'm sure you've heard him say it, but he likes to say that, you know, the, the battle isn't really if it's, you know, it's not really Compass versus the other real estate companies. It's the standard real estate company versus like the Zillow and the Redfin and the mm -hmm. changes that are coming in the market. And it, it seems like Compass is really the only one that's positioned themselves to sort of make that jump, you know, with technology and um, a good search engine platform and getting the funding behind it. Um, but just from having seen, you know, all your history in Malibu, like, what do you think about what real estate's going to look like in 10 years? You know, can there still be boutique real estate companies that exist? Is it, uh, you know, can the, can the real estate model still exist? Do you think Compass can still wow. keep us employed? Yes. Um, I, I just think that what Compass is doing and what Compass is building is, is 100% for the agents. You know, these other companies, some of them that you mentioned, are 0% for the agents. Um, and I think that uh, some of the other, the boutiques, that's a really interesting question because, you know, when I started, you know, 40 some years ago, that there weren't the national companies. You know, they slowly crept in, but it was all boutiques back then. And it was all the person's name, you know, and I, I'm thinking in my head, Harold Field, Winnicott, Newton and Associates, Posey Carpentier, and, and you know, General Realty. There were all these little boutiques back then, and they're all gone, right? Mm -hmm. um, so is that going to come again? I don't know. Right now, I think, it, you know, if the market tightens up a little more, I think that they're going to start to exit, you know? They're going to just, but so 10 years from now, wow, that's really hard to kind of picture what it's going to be like then. I know one thing. That, that ocean's still going to be blue and beautiful and people are going to want to live out here. Yeah. And there seems to be a lot of people in this town, in this city, that have a lot of money. And there's going to be a huge transfer of wealth to kids and, and, and grandkids in the next 10, 20 years. And, you know, most people, when they get a chunk of money, what do they want to do? They want to buy real estate. And, uh, you don't think the fire is going to slow people down? Well, I think it has. I think our market this year, is, you know, there's no way there'd be half as many sales otherwise other than that. So I think it's attributable to that. But I also think that what happened up in Santa Barbara, Montecito, uh, which was pretty similar. I mean, they had worse flooding, obviously, and people actually dying. Um, but, you know, they had a horrible fire up there, too, and it took about a year and a half. And that market is that market's back. Um, I mean, a ton of people went up to Hope Ranch and were buying, and Hope Ranch is kind of like, I don't know if it's like Point Doom or not, but some people have said that. But but I, I think that, yeah, I think there's a little pause for some people right now. But, I mean, look, somebody just bought a house out here for $100 million. And we've had three, I think, approximate $100 million sales out here in the last two or three years. So, you know, beach homes are still selling for 20 and $30 million. So I, I think... The, the long term out here is still as as great as ever, you know. 
Yeah, it seems to be. It's we were driving up the coast the other day on caravan and just just, you know, kind of joking with each other like, you know, isn't it amazing that this like little, you know, 300 foot by 50 foot, you know, square of land can be like 8 million dollars. Like it's just we just yeah. kind of live in an alternate reality, but it it's is. an amazing place to be though, you know. It's like I mean, at the end of the day, your life sort of comes down to, you know, everybody, at least for the most part, has to go to work and do something and provide for their family. And, you know, Malibu is a pretty amazing place. I mean, you can get to anywhere you want to be, you know, or, or I should say you can get to just about anything you want, like within an hour of being here. But mm -hmm. it's like being on vacation, you know, we can clock out and go surf. We had an amazing morning this morning. It just reminds me of how much I love living here. And, and real estate's just been such a great job for that. You know, it's just being able to stay in this community and watch my kids grow up and, you know, have a great job and still make it to soccer practice. And I'm just very grateful for the life that real estate's afforded me out here. It is great being an independent contractor. When it's good, it's good. Hmm? <laughs> um, what else do we have for Jay? Um, oh, just because of, you know, all your, your years and uh, accumulated wisdom from those years, um, you know, what would be some of your best advice for, for buyers and sellers in real estate? Like, what, if you had to pick, you know, one thing you would tell a seller and one thing you would tell a buyer that you have learned over the years, can you, can you give us something? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, when I did do some selling, I mostly worked with sellers. I mostly worked listings with sellers. And, and in fact, one of the reasons I, I, really liked managing and not selling was because uh, buyers just, I just had a hard time with buyers. You know, it's the old saying, buyers are liars. But whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I just know that loyalty was a really big deal in this business. And I just never got those two or three really solid clients that would just consistently do business with me and refer me business. And, and in fact, things kind of went the other way. So it was, you know, this business is really hard. I think from the outside, it probably looks really easy to some people, but this business where you could go days, weeks, months, you know, a year without making a deal and your whole paycheck revolves around, sometimes it's a dog coming in and not liking the house, let alone kids, right? <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's got so many challenges. And then once you get in the escrow, so my advice for sellers would be to listen to your agent when they're telling you what the price of the property should be, because for some reason in Malibu, the average time on the market is, is like two, three, four, five times what it is like anywhere else around here. And, you know, sellers, uh, they hear about that one sale. And of course their house is bigger, better, whatever. And they want to price it that or more. So, um, I think the agents in this town, especially you guys, you guys know your stuff and know what a house should be priced at. And it's just proven time after time. The, the higher you go, the longer you're going to wait to sell the home. And eventually you're going to end up having to come down a lot more than had you priced it to the market to begin with. It, it, if anything, price it a little below market. You know, I always tell people when I was selling, I'd rather have you turn down offers, you know, than not get any offers at all. So I think pricing is still the name of the game uh, in Malibu. I think people want to buy homes that are done. I think they're willing to pay more money for homes that are done. Uh, there's that rare client that, that wants to pay a lot less and get something that's totally, you know, fixer upper. But I think for the most part, time is money. People would rather pay more money to have something that's done. And, you know, for buyers, you know, I would say if you find a property that you really like in your area, first of all, no property is perfect. Even a brand new home is not perfect. So I think setting that expectation up front to a buyer is probably a smart thing to do that, that whatever you find, you know, you should have a checklist. And if you, you can check most of those boxes, then you should jump in and, uh, yeah, let your agent go to work for you and, and negotiate the best deal possible. But, you know, I wouldn't lose a house over $10,000 or, you know, because they didn't throw in the washer dryer. I mean, we see some crazy stuff, right? People get very emotional in this business. So I think managing those expectations is really important. And, uh, you know, having professionals around here like you guys and everyone in this office, is, it's, it's such a pleasure, you know, to, to work here in this environment. I'm Tony Mark. And I'm Russell Grether of the Mark and Grether Group. Thank you for joining us on the Malibu Podcast. Malibu, Malibu.